again of our next installment or our next unit in uh, Ready Graphic Procedures 3 and 4. We're going to be covering uh, myelography in that chapter. Maybe a wrong number. Let me see if I fix that. Uh, just quickly into our table of contents here. Let's see if I thought I might have corrected that late last Friday, but I want to double check to be sure. Make sure I'm not misleading you. No, chapter 14 is correct. And then artha, arthograms are chapter 13. Um, arthogram is going to be the second um, section of this recorded lecture. We're going to start out with mylography, which is um, radiographic evaluation of the spinal cord. All right, so defining myelography, I just did radiographic uh, examination of the spinal cord, and we're going to inject contrast media uh, into the cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds the spinal cord and um, into the space between uh, the meninges. And what are the meninges? Well, those are the three layers of membranes that surround the central nervous system. Uh, so we'll be reviewing that real quickly in the first few slides um, that take pictures from um, your anatomy and physiology book or your structure and function book. So uh, you may have seen these pictures before. You won't find them in your Merrill's Atlas ne necessarily. So know that I've gone back to the structure and function book for some of these uh, illustrations. Uh, I th thought that that would serve you guys better in the review of the central nervous system. Okay. Describe myelography's role in modern clinical practice. Will we use it to evaluate pathology of the central nervous system and um, the vertebral column in relation to the central nervous system? Because as we know, the vertebral column houses the spinal cord. And so uh, if there is any pathology or a degenerative change to the vertebral column, it could influence and affect the central nervous system and the spinal cord and the network of um, tributary nerves that are uh, coming off of the spinal cord. Um, we'll talk about the procedural preparations, the risks and the complications. Uh, myelography, we have saved this until you have become, hopefully, um, comfortable in the clinical setting. Myelography is one of the few exams where if we don't, um, we don't do things in a very specific way, we could cause some serious complications for our patient up to including uh, death. So we want to pay attention about the risks of the myelography procedure because death could result in our patient if we do not um, follow certain safety precautions. Um, detail specific positions and tasks unique to myelogram exams. Uh, typically that's going to be describing um, radiography upon the fluoroscopy table of the contrast enhanced tissue. All right, so <clears throat> filum terminale, delicate fibrous portion that connects the terminal tip to the first coccygeal segment. Okay, uh, connected to 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Okay, that's the whole spinal cord, not just the filum terminale. The filum terminale is um, an anchoring of uh, the dural sac to the coccyx. Okay. Um, the spinal nerves come out of the spinal roots and the spinal roots come out of the spinal cord through the intervertebral foramen. So through the cervical spine, they're coming off at an anterior angle of 45 degrees from the midsagittal plane. 
um, through the thoracic and lumbar region, those nerve roots are coming off uh, in the coronal plane because those intervertebral foramen open um, through the lateral projections. So that's where you see the nerve roots um, leaving the spinal cord left and right is from the intervertebral foramen. Okay? And the sacral foramen, which are posterior. So through the sacrum, they exit um, posteriorly uh, and anteriorly. Uh, cauda equina refers to spinal nerves. Um, slender, elongated structure. Cauda equina from Latin translates to the horse's tail. And the conus medullaris is the end of the spinal cord. The terminus of the solid spinal cord is at about the level of L1, L2. Uh, and the cauda equina uh, is the horse's tail. It's all the, the, the spinal nerve roots. Um, but specifically, it refers to the... Um, typically when they say cauda equina, they're referring to the area of the spinal canal below L1, L2, because that's only nerve roots from that point on. Uh, the nerve roots for the lower vertebral uh, uh, levels kind of flower out of the conus medullaris uh, right, at the, uh, right at L1, L2, uh, and... Uh, at that point, there's about 20 of those. Hang on. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so the solid end of the spinal cord is the conus medullaris. Um, the top end, of course, the pons and the medulla oblongata. Um, and then the dural sac for the spinal cord terminates uh, somewhere around S3, S4. Okay? And then that phylum terminale is a fibrous tether that tethers to the first coccygeal segment. Okay. Spinal cord and meninges. Well, the, the solid spinal cord itself in transverse cross section will have a gray matter and a white matter to it and the gray matter is kind of h-shaped and the gray matter um, tends to make up the nerve roots okay um, now the meninges the meningeal layers you will have to know these the meningeal layers uh, form the blood brain barrier around the brain and the spinal cord and that is um, our circulatory system deposits the um, nutrients and the oxygen and the dissolved oxygen and the sugar into this membrane system and then the nutrients pass across the membranes uh, in order to bathe the nerve tissue in uh, the dissolved oxygen and the nutrients. It's, it's a layer of isolation separating the most delicate, uh, irreplaceable nerve structures from direct contact with the circulatory system. And the reason for that separation is to prevent, um, it's a protection against infection. It prevents um, infection of the central nervous system and uh, infection by uh, external pathogens. Okay. Uh, so there's three layers. There is the inner sheath, the pia mater, highly vascular and closely adhered. So that's what carries the blood supply into the system. And then uh, above the pia mater is the subarachnoid space. Uh, it's a wide fluid filled space between the arachnoid and the pia mater. It is the reservoir for the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, the arachnoid layer is a delicate central sheath. And then the um, dura matter is a tough, fibrous physical protection. Uh, and that makes up the outside layer 
of the meningeal, the meninges. Okay, so the three layers are pia matter, dura matter, and arachnoid. The arachnoid is the middle layer, and the subarachnoid space, also called the fecal sac, is the reservoir for the cerebral spinal fluid. And it's the cerebral spinal fluid is the conduit that takes nutrition from the vascular system, from the circulatory system, and transfers it to um, the nerve cells of the central nervous system. Um, so this is this functions as a layer of protection, both physical and pathogenic uh, immune system protection. All right, so we have the gray matter and the white matter. Um, the gray matter forms the spinal nerve roots. There's an anterior and a posterior, uh, ventral and a dorsal, or anterior and posterior root. Okay, and they form the spinal nerves. They merge to form the spinal nerves. Um, and then there's the three. You can see in the diagram. There's the three membrane layers that sheath um, the actual nerve tissue. The dura matter is the outermost layer. Um, Separated from vertebral periosteum by the epidural space. So um, outside of the dura matter, there's an epidural layer. Um, so the dura matter doesn't come in direct contact with uh, the periosteum of the vertebral bone. Um, there's a epidural space in between the bone and the dura matter. ventricular system okay so while we're learning monograms it's it's good for us to review the ventricles of the brain because they are connected to the subarachnoid space um, so there are four ventricles of the brain uh, the lateral ventricles are paired there's a left and right lateral ventricle with an anterior horn and a posterior horn sitting in between and and draining the lateral ventricles is the third ventricle, which sits in the midbrain. Uh, and then the third ventricle drains into the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. Uh, and then the fourth ventricle drains to the subarachnoid space. So the cerebral spinal fluid is actually produced in specialized cells of the anterior horn and the posterior horn of the lateral ventricles, uh, possibly being produced in the third and fourth ventricles as well. Um, and this ventricular system is d in direct connection to the subarachnoid, uh, subarachnoid layer that contains the cerebral spinal fluid that acts as a, a barrier of protection it's the blood-brain barrier, but it's also a uh, shock-absorbing system. Uh, when we talk about the science of concussions, um, the brain is floating in the cerebral spinal fluid of the subarachnoid layer, uh, and the spinal cord is also floating in the cerebral spinal fluid. So uh, both um, tissues are protected by this um, outer floating fluid um, system uh, that kind of absorbs physical shocks uh, to the spine or, or to the central nervous system. All right, so the ventricular system, there are four irregular shaped fluid containing cavities. Uh, they produce the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, the ventricles communicate with each other through connecting channels. They don't actually talk. That means that's a synonym for connection. So they um, pass cerebral spinal fluid, usually from the lateral ventricles down through um, the third and fourth ventricle, and then reabsorbed, um, eventually reabsorbed somewhere in the spinal canal.
So like I said on the previous slide, you have two lateral ventricles, a left and a right, um, and that's in the cerebrum. Um, the third ventricle is located in the midbrain. The fourth ventricle is located in, um, in between the cerebellum and the medulla oblongata. Radiographic examination may be used to demonstrate the bony anatomy for trauma pathology, degenerative changes, and post-operative changes. Should always be performed before contrast procedures such as monography. In addition, with the advent of MRI, uh, so long as the patient is able to have an MRI, an MRI can provide superior imaging of uh, pathological and degenerative changes to the spine and uh, the spinal cord um, preferable to a monography study. Typically the only monography studies we're doing in the modern era are those in which the patient is contraindicated for MRI because of um, foreign metal bodies, be they surgical implants, shrapnel, uh, iron filings from uh, being a machinist, uh, so on and so forth. Any, anything that would have some kind of metal, um, internal metal implants, uh, any patient with it would necessarily be contraindicated for MRI, and then therefore uh, myography is the best way to visualize um, any type of pathology associated with uh, the central nervous system and the spinal cord. Myelography is usually performed as an outpatient procedure. Um, and again, if your patient can have an MRI instead of a myelogram, the MRI is preferred. Um, but we still do myelograms on those patients that uh, cannot have an MRI for whatever reason, uh, whether they have pacemakers or metal fusion rods or shrapnel or so on and so forth. Anything that gets you off of the safety screening list for an MRI um, gets you qualified for a monogram if you need that, if you need your uh, central nervous system evaluated and the spinal cord evaluated. Okay. Contrast, we're going to use a water-soluble, non-ionic, ionidated medium. Okay, so iodine contrast, uh, injectable, Okay. We want it to be water soluble because the cerebral spinal fluid is made out of water and iodine is a necessary nutrient and um, the body will actually reabsorb the iodine over uh, a period of time, about a week, and the iodine will transfer out of the cerebral spinal fluid and into the lymphatic and uh, venous systems uh, to be removed and excreted from the body. Okay, so it doesn't hang out there uh, forever and ever, and it doesn't promote um, pathogenic infection. It doesn't promote any kind of uh, sepsis, uh, so long as the contrast is prepared uh, in accordance with sterile procedure. Uh, the room should be prepared by the RT before the patient arrival. Table and the equipment cleaned. Uh, footboard and shoulder supports attached. If you're doing a cervical myelogram, you're going to need shoulder supports. Also, a thoracic myelogram, you might need shoulder supports. Uh, they might, the radiologist might tip the table Trandellenburg in order to get the contrast to roll uh, superiorly in the spinal canal. Okay. Uh, radiographic equipment checked. You want to make sure the fluoroscope is actually working. Uh, the footboard is actually attached correctly. The shoulder supports are attached correctly. Image intensifier locked to prevent accidental contact with sterile field or spinal needle. And this is going to be the vertical lock. You're not going to want, you typically your fluoroscopy tower can raise as well as going from the head to the feet of the table and to the left and to the right of the patient. It can also be raised and lowered and actually come uh, go farther away from the patient or come closer to the patient. Well, you want to disable that mechanism and usually there's a lockout switch or knob uh, such that the image intensifier is locked at a specific fixed height and you don't accident, you can't accidentally 
descend down onto the patient uh, while the radiologist is trying to advance the needle. Okay, um, so make sure you learn where that button is, where that um, is. A, it's a little toggle clamp for the uh, GE systems. I remember it's a little metal toggle clamp on a rail, and you raise it up, and it prevents the image intensifier from uh, collapsing and telescoping back down towards the patient. Okay, uh, that step is important because uh, the radiologist is going to be. First of all, you're going to paint the back of the patient's back, either you or the radiologist, um, with iodine soap with the intention of establishing a sterile field. Well, you don't want the, the image intensifier and, or the digital fluoroscopy tower to come in contact with that sterile field uh, once you've established that sterile field. So that's, but then also when the radiologist is advancing a three and a half inch spinal needle, trying to make a delicate placement of the tip of the needle into the fecal sac, you don't want to accidentally grudge or, or, or grudge, nudge, or push the spinal needle um, or to knock the radiologist's hands while they're advancing the spinal needle. So always a good idea to lock the height of the image intensifier before myelography. Uh, Pre-medication is rarely needed. Uh, your patient in the modern era, your patient is going through a um, pre-procedural interview with either a radiology nurse or the physician, or the radiologist themselves. Um, they've been pre-screened with a history and physical, um, their medication list, and as well as their known allergies have been shared, that, that documentation has been shared with the radiology department uh, 24 hours before the myelogram is scheduled to take place. The patient is well hydrated. They've been given pre-exam instructions to drink plenty of water. Um, that makes for a more um, hydrous um, fecal sac or subarachnoid space. Uh, and therefore, uh, there's more volume and it's easier to get access to it. Uh, certain pathologies like meningitis can actually dehydrate the uh, subarachnoid space and cause a reduction in volume of cerebral spinal fluid. So I want to make sure the patient drinks several glasses of water the night before and maybe even a glass of water the morning of the exam. Uh, procedural details, including table movement, sensations, should be explained. Okay. Um, it's possible that the needle, as it advances, will um, graze or bump a nerve root. Okay. When this happens, a phantom pain and or a phantom motor response can be exhibited in the patient. That is, it's possible they can kick like a mule without uh, even realizing that they're kicking like a mule uh, because the radiologist has come in close contact with a spinal nerve, okay? uh, which can happen. Scout images typically are AP and laterals of the uh, lumbar spine. Um, and if you're doing, uh, you're going to at least need an AP projection of the lumbar spine to demonstrate the access area to the radiologist radiographically. But if you're doing a thoracic or a cervical myelogram, you'll also need to take AP and lateral images of those sections of the spine as well before the patient is prepped for needle access. The patient will lie prone for the actual spinal puncture. Okay, Sometimes the patient lies laterally if there's difficulty in gaining access with the spine flex. So they kind of curl up in the ball and raise their knees toward their head. Cellular warfare, antiseptics, iodine versus chloroprep. Okay. Um, so pay attention to how I've described how these things kill bacteria. So iodine kills bacteria via extreme dehydration. Okay via hydrophilic properties and osmosis. So what happens is, is you surround single cell bacteria with iodine 
and all the water inside the bacteria wants to leave the bacteria so it can um, dilute the iodine that is outside the bacterial cell. So eventually the bacteria shrivels up like a raisin and once it loses the majority of its water content it can't promote its own cellular metabolism uh, and therefore it dies from extreme de dehydration. Okay, So consider that versus Chloroprep, what Chloroprep does. Chloroprep is like Shiva the Destroyer. Chloroprep is an organic bleach that digests and rips apart cell membranes. Now, consider the actions of both of these and which one of these chemicals would you want inside your spinal canal? Hope you said the iodine, okay? Because what's your cerebral spinal fluid made out of? It's made out of mostly water. So the iodine, if some of the iodine from the skin surface gets into, transported by the injection needle, gets into the fecal sac, the subarachnoid space, it's not a big deal. There's plenty of water there. So the iodine is effectively going to be uh, diluted out of any kind of uh, usefulness. The chloroprep, however, it will be diluted, but it'll still do this job, except now it'll be really, really close to nerve cells and nerve tissue. Um, so, yeah, the axons and the dendrites and the, the parts of the neuron, all of that surrounded by a cell membrane. Well, the chloroprep doesn't care whether it's a bacteria cell, a skin cell, any kind of cell. It's just ripping apart the proteins that comprise the cell membranes. Um, so for that reason, we don't use chlor chloroprep for myelograms because it could cause nerve tissue damage uh, if any of the chloroprep makes its way into the um, subarachnoid space, the fecal sac. So always, always, always prep your monograms with betadine. Never prep your monograms with chloroprep. All right. Chloroprep is contraindicated for my myelography. Local anesthetic is going to be given at the puncture site by the radiologist. The spinal needle is going to be inserted and checked for position. Uh, the radiologic technologist will be checking for position uh, with spot exposures from the fluoroscope. Okay, Cerebral spinal fluid is usually withdrawn and sent to the laboratory for a lumbar puncture. Contrast is injected after any needed cerebral spinal fluid has been withdrawn. Um, table angle and gravity is used to move the contrast under fluoroscopy. So depending upon what section of the spine you're evaluating um, determines whether or not the patient is stood up uh, feet down or stood on their head for cervical myelography. And then the radiologist will take spot images as needed. They'll roll the patient into obliques. They'll roll the patient to a lateral. Uh, they'll stand the patient all the way up, so on and so forth. So here's a representative picture of myelography. Okay. Um, and of course, as soon as the contrast is injected, there's no more reason for the needle to be in place. So as soon as the radiologist injects the contrast, usually the next step is to remove the spinal needle. Uh, once the contrast is in there, it's not removed for the remainder of the procedure. Uh, it's left there uh, up to and including the post CT examination after the myelogram. So a uh, sterile field can be torn down at that point. Uh, a band-aid can be applied to the surface of the patient's back covering the injection site and the radiologist can resume the control of the fluoroscope at that point in time. The technologist uh, moves to the head of the table or the feet of the table to steady the patient and keep the patient from assist the patient to get into the preferred positions that the radiologist wants and keep the patient from falling off the table. All right, so what is contrast-assisted 
monography look like? Well, this is a radiograph, and the black lines, you see those there? Those are the nerve roots coming off of the spinal cord. You see there's black shadows at every level. Well, um, remember, the contrast is going to absorb the x-rays, and this is a negative uh, image uh, fluoroscope shot. So uh, the contrast shows up as white, uh, just like the bones. And uh, the black indicates solid tissue where the contrast is not allowed to flow. So in the center, that black column is the actual spinal cord. Uh, and then off to the sides, those sloping black lines coming out just underneath the pedicles, those are the nerve roots heading through the intervertebral foramens. Uh, so the radiologist can evaluate those and see if there's any uh, excessive tapering or stenosis. Uh, right. Now, I told you there was going to be risks, very real risks for myelography. So uh, if the contrast is allowed to go up into the head and into the ventricular system, very, very bad things can happen. So if we move contrast to the cervical area for a cervical myelogram, the head is always positioned in acute extension. That means the chin, patient's laying prone, chin resting on the table um, with their neck extended as far as it can go. What that's going to do is that's going to kink off the opening to um, the fourth ventricle and not allow the cerebral spinal fluid to flow up into the head, which is good because that has known to cause, uh, known to be the root cause of seizures and procedural death uh, if the contrast makes its way up into the ventricular system. Uh, like I said, very, very bad things can happen to your patient. So always, always, always remember uh, if you are doing cervical myelography, the head must remain in acute extension. And your radiologist is going to know this too. So post-procedure monitoring, after you get done taking your fluoroscopic images, well, you need to take advantage, and that's what the radiologist will intend to do. There's no use putting contrast into and around the spinal cord without taking really, really good images of it. So yes, you'll take some fluoroscopic images, but the best images you can acquire will be a CT scan of the lumbar spine or that particular site of the spine uh, about 30 to 40 minutes post procedure and that's the nooks and crannies rule or what I call the nooks and crannies rule so um, while your patient is recovering and usually that should be uh, a designated area waiting area uh, typically it's behind a it's it's either a holding room in radiography in the radiology department uh, where the radiology nurse is monitoring the patient or it's a holding area in CT and the CT techs have direct line of sight to the patients. The head and shoulders should be elevated 30 to 45 degrees, so semi fowler's position. The patient should be on bed rest for several hours post-procedure. patient should be encouraged to take in additional fluids to uh, allow for that excess uh, iodine contrast to start passing from the cerebral spinal fluid and into the lymphatic system. The puncture site should be checked to make sure the cerebral spinal fluid is not leaking from the puncture site, which can sometimes happen. Um, and then the CT scan, CT technologist should be notified that their patient, their post myelogram patient is ready um, and what time they, they were put in the holding bay because the contrast will get into the tight areas, the very, very, where, where the thecal sac tapers either naturally or because of stenosis. Um, it takes a little while, uh, very much like the correct way to eat an English muffin. And the reason they talk about the nooks and crannies. So if you've ever eaten an English muffin, do you slap the cold butter on your hot toasted English muffin and then immediately throw that thing into your mouth? No, you don't do that. You wait for the butter to 
spread through the English muffin and soak into the tiny nooks and crannies. Well, that's the same thing you're doing with myography with the contrast. You're trying to let the iodine contrast permeate through um, the very, very tiny portions of the uh, fecal sac, the subarachnoid space, so that the stenosis can be clearly identified. And without that 30 to 40 minute wait, you might actually miss a stenosis on the CT scan. Right, so what is a stenosis? Well, typically it looks like this. It is a tapering or a narrowing of the spinal canal. And we got a moderate one at the level above a severe one at, it looks like that's going to be L4, L5, and then a moderate one just above it. I would say that um, L3, L4 is moderate stenosis. It is narrowed. It's not narrowed to nothing like you see at L4, L5. Um, but the, both of these narrowings are caused by posterior herniation of the uh, disc, the intervertebral discs at these levels. And they can actually crowd the fecal sac, they can crowd the nerve roots, um, and they can crowd the intervertebral foramen with this unwanted pressure um, from a bulging or herniated disc. Okay. So that's what we're looking for when we do myelography. Uh, that's the root cause of the patient's pathology, typically. All right. So this is a post-CT myelogram uh, versus a different patient uh, MRI, but you can see uh, both have signs of stenosis um, at the red arrows in the CT scan. Uh, those are signs of stenosis. And then uh, just above the region of the white arrows, you can see a vertebral body or a vertebral disc that is just about closed off all of the white section. Um, now, fun fact about MRIs, you don't actually need contrast for an MRI scan. Um, the water in the cerebral spinal fluid can be activated through the T1 scans uh, to highlight, just like it was contrast, uh, the hydrogen on the water molecules in the cerebral spinal fluid will uh, return robust signal, and it's almost like the tissue is contrast enhanced. But you can see very, very similar uh, ability to diagnose stenosis on both types of scans. Uh, CT post myelogram with uh, the white on the left-hand side, that's actually the injected contrast bolus, whereas the white on the MRI slice is just the water of the cerebral spinal fluid. All right, so that's all of myelography. Um, now, this isn't the last slide. There's uh, looks like 27 more. I am going to talk about, I think I talk about arthrograms, and then I also talk about, uh, might be talking about venipuncture, or might be talking about sterile technique at the end of uh, the conclusion of the lecture. So we'll have to see. But this is all uh, the entire unit on myelography. That's everything you need to know. Uh, preparations, risks, complications, uh, and then uh, specific positions and tasks unique to myelograms is going to be uh, your cross-table lateral lumbar spine, typically, uh, and then also the scalp films. So. And beginning chapter 13, contrast orthography. All right, well, uh, if myelography was uh, injection of the fecal sac, the subarachnoid space, with contrast media, then orthography is contrast-enhanced joint spaces. So what are we going to do in contrast orthography? Very similar to a myogram, except for we are going to apply the sterile prep to a patient's synovial joint space or the tissue above the patient's synovial joint space. The radiologist is going to gain needle access to the synovial joint space and inject a volume of um, iodinated contrast media yet again to fill the synovial joint space this time uh, such that um, we have a contrast enhanced uh, radiograph. Uh, and then post CT as well uh, of the joint in question. 
Okay, so in modern clinical practice, orthography is still useful, uh, especially, again, in patients that cannot have an MRI. Um, MRI is, again, superior in imaging and diagnosing pathology of joints. Um, but if the patient is contraindicated because of the presence of metal uh, or pacemaker or what have you, then the arthrogram, uh, the fluoros fluoroscopic arthrogram, is the safe alternative. Oh, excuse me. Is the safe alternative to um, the MRI of the patient's joint. Okay. Perceivers or preparations, risks, and complications. These are actually, it's actually quite safe to do an arthrogram relative to doing a monogram. So uh, the risks are infection, but the risks are also um, contrast reaction. But because it's in the synovial space, the risk for contrast reaction is almost non existent. Contrast orthography is radiographic examination of the soft tissue structures of the joints, in particular the synovial space and the, the synovial fluid space, after the injection of contrast media. MRI has largely replaced contrast orthography. MRI is non invasive, so fewer risks are associated. Um, occasionally, arthrograms are used to administer MRI contrast into the joint space with a contrasted MR study immediately following. So sometimes you'll get a patient that'll have a CT post-arthrogram, and sometimes you'll have patients that'll have MR post-arthrogram, especially if you're injecting gadolinium with the iodine contrast. Okay. Arthrography is performed on shoulders, knees, wrists, hips, TMJs, but it can be performed on any joint. These are just the most common ones. Any joint that has a synovial space can have an arthrogram performed. Um, it's just a matter of getting a needle into that synovial space uh, and injecting an appropriate volume of contrast. For your larger joints, the shoulder and the hip, usually you're doing about 10 cc's of iodinated contrast. Uh, the knee as well. Um, smaller joints, like the wrist and the TMJ, uh, two cc's of contrast is sufficient, probably not even that. Uh, so the m amount of contrast that is injected varies according to the body part being examined. Okay. Now, uh, those of you here in Nashville, Tennessee, for any duration of time might have remembered a quarterback named Steve McNair. And you might have remembered that he had a rotator cuff tear that was treated by Baptist Sports Medicine. And as part of the treatment for the rotator cuff tear and repair, uh, they performed a contrast arthrogram of his shoulder. But because the technologists were starstruck at Baptist Sports Medicine, they failed to follow um, aseptic technique violated and contaminated their own sterile field, and McNair was hospitalized with a staph infection in his shoulder and missed the entire season. Okay. So, uh, general procedure guidelines. We'll use a local anesthetic in the area of contrast injection. Procedure should be for performed under sterile technique or aseptic conditions with an LP or arthrogram tray prepared by the technologist. Okay, and remember the rules of sterile technique. If you think you have contaminated, tell on yourself. Okay, you never know when it will cost the season of a certain hometown hero. So, uh, contrast is administered under fluoroscopy, typically by the radiologist after the radiologist has advanced um, a spinal needle. Uh, and now, I say a spinal needle, but uh, that's for the shoulder and the hip. For the wrist, they can use a conventional inch and a half uh, small gauge needle to gain access uh, to the uh, synovial space. Radiographs or spot films, you should be taking scalp films, pre-contrast injection, uh, AP and lateral, uh, sometimes for the shoulders, just internal, external rotation or internal and uh, 
internal rotation and then external with Gracie, um, oblique, uh, whatever your radiologist wants. Just look at the protocol. Um, and then um, after contrast is administered, the radiologist will take a series of spot films uh, and he might ask you to do some post contrast injection radiographs before you send them on to CT or MRI. Joint effusion, if present, is aspirated after local anesthesia, but before contrast administration. So if we have, let's say there's fluid on the knee, uh, and this is a uh, stat arthrogram coming from the ED, it might be that the whole point of the procedure is to gain needle access to the fluid space so that you can draw off excess fluid. Um, not necessarily draw, uh, injecting any contrast at all. So um, that's commonly done by an ER physician in the case of a knee, uh, but it's within the realm of possibility that other joint effusions, if, especially if the access is tricky, um, might be delegated to the radiologist uh, with the use of the fluoroscope to assist. Okay. After the contrast is injected, the radiologist will manipulate the joint to distribute the contrast. Okay. So for a shoulder arthrogram, which is one of the more common ones, you can use single or double contrast techniques. Um, and then this bottom left-hand corner of this slide, I want to point out that that is a rotator cuff tear sign. So when you see a vertical line of contrast, riding in between um, the humeral head and the acromion uh, that is uh, leaking of the contrast into the rotator cuff and the rotator cuff is torn otherwise the contrast wouldn't uh, flow here so we see a normal arthrogram in the top right uh, contrast assist and there is no um, horizontal line immediately underneath the acromion so there is no rotator cuff tear but in the bottom left that is the sign of a rotator cuff tear so you should know that for the registry exam um, you can as is shown in the top right picture you can see that there's some air pockets there uh, underneath the patient's shoulder um, and then also superimposed over the greater trochanter. There's also an air bubble there. Uh, so this patient is lying down. Um, so you can, the radiologist can inject just 10 cc's of contrast or they can inject 5 cc's of contrast and 5 cc's of air uh, to fill up the joint cavity and they can get a double contrast study, uh, which gives them slightly more information, formation of any bursa um, or things of that nature can reveal themselves with a double contrast study. Um, and then this bottom right picture is just um, showing the fenestrated drape and the prepped area and the radiologist advancing the needle into the location of the joint. All right, common projections for shoulder. You're going to do internal and external. Uh, you might do a Gracie method, uh, you might do an axillary or a tangential method too, especially if they're positive for rotator cuff tear. CT is often used in conjunction with shoulder arthrograms. So post-procedure, um, if you've already injected contrast into the patient's joint space, uh, just like the myogram, it, it make, make it worth the patient's while, get the best images possible, and those would be cross-sectional slices like in CT or MRI. For knee arthrography, there's a vertical and a horizontal ray method. The vertical ray method uses a stress device, and what you don't see is, because it's not a live picture, um, we're using a little brace just above the knee joint, and then the radiologist is putting stress onto the, the lateral aspect of the uh, tibia and fibula to kind of open the joint space on in each compartment. So you know that the knee's got a medial and a lateral compartment. Well, if you if you push with lateral stress uh, on the tibia and fibula, what happens is uh, 
the tibial plateau kind of angles or obliques to the knee joint and the lateral capsule will expand and you'll be able to better visualize the lateral meniscus and I'll show you guys on the next slide what that looks like okay um, it should be the radiologist that applies the stress not the technologist it should only be a trained professional you should the radiologist should be or the technologist should be running the fluoroscope while the radiologist is applying the correct amount of stress uh, to the lower extremity and the lower leg. Okay, so this is what happens when you do that, is you get a nice air contrast of the meniscus. Um, if we just look at the one labeled, um, that's with stress. You can see that the other side compartment is narrowed and collapsed on itself, but this one is expanded. So it must be that the radiologist is kind of torquing on the tibia and trying to get this compartment to expand. Uh, and you get a nice view of the meniscus uh, when you do that. Um, it helps that it's an air contrast. So the radiologist injected about, I would say about five cc's of contrast, manipulated the knee a little bit to get the contrast to spread to all areas of the synovial space and to really coat the membrane layer of the synovial space and then filled the synovial space with air injected uh, another five to seven cc's of air uh, and then you get expansion of the knee joint and um, the contrast tends to adhere to the walls of the space while the air fills the center of the synovial space and then with just a little bit of um, manipulation of the lower extremity you can expand one the lateral compartment or the medial compartment uh, by uh, applying lateral or medial stress respectively and you get some nice air contrast pictures of the meniscus okay. uh, horizontal method uh, also uses double contrast um, the patient is prone placed semi-prone with the medial so you kind of give him an oblique with a horizontal knee arthrograph method um, again we're using manual stress but we kind of put the patient into an oblique posture rather than a conventional prone posture okay so they either roll so their kneecap is facing externally 45 degrees out or internally 45 degrees in and then you apply the stress Okay. and that's the horizontal ray method okay so you would have the patient up on their side uh, for this method or semi pro all right um, to demonstrate the lateral meniscus you patient put the patient semi prone with a lateral meniscus up so again an oblique with the lateral compartment elevated uh, and then also apply stress again for wrist arthrogram, the indications for wrist arthrogram are trauma, persistent pain, and limitation of range of motion. And typically, wrist arthrograms are used to describe degenerative changes to uh, the wrist. Either can be acute, where uh, they think that maybe the synovial sac has ruptured and um, possibly in combination with a Colley's fracture. Uh, persistent pain would indicate possibly a carpal tunnel type situation uh, and limitation of motion would indicate degenerative arthritis so all of those for wrist arthrogram you're going to well the radiologist is not going to inject as much contrast here because the space is not as voluminous so look to, for the radiologist to only inject one to two cc's of the contrast you should draw up five on the tray um, but the radiologist will only use one or two CCs. Okay. Uh, you're going to do a PA and lateral both obliques as scouts of the wrist in question. Um, usually you activate live floral while the wrist is rotating with contrast in it to detect any leaks because um, it's not a high pressure uh, synovial space. Uh, 
So you really got to get gravity to help you. That's why you need to roll the wrist in different rotations under live fluoro to see if the contrast leaks out anywhere okay, of the recognized synovial compartment. And the radiologist will be able to spot that. Okay. Doing a hip arthrogram, you can use it to evaluate congenital hip dysplasia or dislocation, um, defective hip prosthesis, uh, confirmation of infection with if you aspirate and, and send the synovial fluid to culture before you inject contrast you can confirm hip and hip joint infection uh, and you can also administer a steroid local anesthetic cocktail which is uh, those hip injections are very really common because they tend to delay hip replacement surgery in our geriatric population so uh, nine times out of the ten when I did a hip arthrogram it wasn't to do a diagnostic evaluation it was to administer um, steroid and local anesthetic long-lasting local anesthetic to the inside of the synovial space of the hip in question um, but regardless if you're going to do a hip arthrogram uh, your radiologist is probably going to want about 10 cc's of iodinated contrast to inject uh, procedure is very much the same you're going to just like you're doing a so shoulder or even doing a monogram you got to paint the area of injection where you expect the injection to occur uh, helpful to remember how to locate a hip remember that line between the symphysis pubis and the asis and then draw perpendicular and then two and a half inches down that's where you should put the center of your iodine field if you're painting for a hip joint injection two and a half inches down that perpendicular line uh, same as you find uh, the center of a hip for a trauma hip x-ray okay you will be doing scalp films ahead of time uh, for a congenital hip dislocation you should probably substitute a Danielis Miller rather than a frog leg lateral um, again uh, dislocate that would be a trauma or that would be a known pathology so once you take the AP and it's strong for suspicion of dysplasia uh, then you probably shoot across table lateral rather than a frog leg hip for that scalp film and again for the post contrast uh, films post injection films if you're shooting those at the end of the procedure okay. uh, aseptic techniques can be applied in any clinical setting okay so aseptic techniques is a set of rules and um, I just uploaded the separate video on that today uh, so they can be applied just about anywhere they can be applied in the OR they can be applied in fluoroscopy they can be applied in an ED exam room typical situations that call for aseptic measures include surgery and insertion of intravenous lines urinary catheters and drains so basically whenever you are placing some device inside a patient some tool whether it be an IV or a catheter or a needle or a blade uh, you typically want to clean the skin surface first and depending upon how complex your procedure is maybe set up some sterile instrumentation too uh, in the case of surgery and uh, arthrograms and monograms um, the goal is to prevent infection prevent the spread of pathogens and harmful microorganisms most notably the ones that the patient is carrying with them on their skin as they come into the hospital okay so that's what the iodine soap is for typically is to reduce and eliminate um, by physical relocation that's why we do the expanding circles um, the if the bacteria is not immediately dehydrated it can be caught up in the foam of the iodine soap and pushed to the outer border of the sterile area or the sterile skin surface okay. sources of infection skin hair nasal pharynx fomites air human error and cross-contamination uh, the last two are uh, what you will bring uh, to 
your sterile procedure, and if you're not careful, uh, you will cause an infection in your patient, either through, through human error or through cross-contamination. Uh, and those are hospital professionals or healthcare professionals that are the last two sources of, of infection. So be mindful of those. Sterile field is just defined as a microorganism-free area. Now, there can be several sterile fields. There can be an instrument tray and the tops of the surface of the patient that is painted with iodine. So both of those are uh, sterile fields. And yes, you can, once you put down a fenestrated drape, the nice thing is, is the radiologist can transfer some instrumentation, most notably the local anesthetic, um, and rest it on the patient on the fenestrated drape, uh, such if it's needed to um, give more numbing medicine, because sometimes they don't, honestly, they don't give enough to start with. And the patient says that they can feel um, the advancement of the needle. Uh, it could be that the radiologist hasn't supplied enough of the local anesthetic. And it's real handy to keep that right there at the patient in case it's needed. Uh, anything not clean, dry, or expired. Okay. So what this means is it's got to be visibly clean. It's got to be dry. It's got to be free from moisture, especially penetrating moisture, and it can't be expired. Okay, so any of those, and it's not, it's no longer sterile. Sterile corridor is the area between the patient stripes and the instrument table. So, within the sterile corridor, only personnel who have donned sterile attire can reside in the sterile corridor, typically. Uh, for a myelogram or arthrogram, that's the immediate bedside of the fluoroscopic table um, and the instrument tray. Okay, the um, if the instrument tray is on the is on the radiologist's left, then the technologist should be standing on the radiologist's right, uh, so that they are not reaching over the instrument tray to run the fluoroscope for the radiologist. Sterile field is established by a sterile drape. Um, first step in using the sterile drape is confirming that the package is sterile. If it appears to have been previously opened or the expiration date has passed, it is considered unsterile. Okay. Dropping contents onto a sterile field, uh, drop them gently onto a field from approximately six inches above the field, and you want to use the wrist rolling method such that you're not touching the contents of the sterile package as it drops, okay? Um, and you also don't want the, the outer packaging to touch the sterile field at any time either because that's a condition. Establishing a sterile field drape, typically you hold a sterile drape vertically and then you you um, let it catch on the far edge of the table and then pull it towards you. Um, and then, of course, anything underneath the edge is no longer sterile. Uh, and then as you drop it onto the surface, that is, you don't open a sterile field away from you, you open a sterile field towards you. Okay? Uh, and then any any part of the cloth or the field drape that lies below the surface of the table is no longer sterile and the outer two two and a half inches of the drape is no longer sterile okay. pouring sterile fluids in a sterile basin you're going to want to remember if you ever find yourself doing this remember that you waste uh, the first two ounces or so uh, into a suitable trash can. Uh, that is to rinse off the neck of the sterile bottle. So you're going to take off the cap. The cap is considered, the outside of the cap is considered unsterile. Okay. The rim of the bottle may be contaminated. So if the rim of the, in order to guard against that, you pour a little bit out, 
into waste to rinse the lid of the neck of the bottle before filling a basin on a sterile field. Okay? You probably won't ever use that one, but it's handy to know because it's part of the complete list of rules for a sterile field. Okay? Surgical scrubbing. You always want to start at the fingertips and work your way toward the elbows. And you always clean the dominant hand first and then transition to the non-dominant hand second. Okay? Um, and all the time you rinse, you wash and lather from the fingertips to the elbows, you rinse from the fingertips to the elbows, and then you pat dry from the fingertips to the elbows. That way um, you're never bringing um, you're never bringing bacteria that is on your elbows towards your fingertips. Sterile gloving, um, best demonstrated in the video. Remember, you always glove your dominant hand first, uh, and you always pinch the bottom of the rolled collar for the first glove, okay? And then you put on the first glove, and then the second glove, you don't pinch the bottom of the rolled collar, you insert your fingers underneath the rolled collar, uh, and then put on the second glove, okay? Once both gloves are on reasonably well to the wrist, then you can fix fingers if any of your fingers got into uh, the wrong finger hole on the gloves. But that's the last step after you have both gloves on. Okay. Removing sterile gloves, you should uh, pinch them um, on the outside and roll them inside, roll the first one inside out and then use the wadding of the first one to pull off the second one, okay? Um, use the wadding of the first one to pull off the second one. And you should be, both of both the gloves should be inside out and one should be contained within the other if you've done it correctly and then toss them in an appropriate waste receptacle. All right. So that was contrast orthography and then a quick review of um, sterile technique at the end of the lecture. So, which just further reinforces what I did in the demonstration. So um, I don't think I'll be doing a whole lot of demonstrating for monogram and orthogram. It's just going to be this recorded lecture and how to set up, set up the tray. When we do get back to an in-person class, uh, we'll take, we'll set aside some time to practice setting up uh, a sterile tray, a monogram tray, so you guys are comfortable with that process. Okay. Um, oh, I didn't cover contrast reactions. Let me speak quickly about contrast reactions for orthograms. Well, it's the synovial space. So, does fluid exchange back and forth to the body tissue to the rest of the body? Um, in the synovial space? And the answer is no. It takes two to three weeks to change out synovial fluid. Uh, it's not like cerebral spinal fluid where you just push fluids and you can change out your cerebral spinal fluid. Um, synovial space is very much isolated from the rest of the body and it takes a long time for the iodine to wash out of the synovial space. Now inside the synovial space the iodine is inert. It's not going to produce an allergic reaction in the synovial space because there are no, um, there are there is no live tissue inside the synovial space. Okay, um, it's shrouded by a inert membrane. So because of that, uh, it's generally safer to inject iodine contrast for an orthogram for a person that's allergic to iodine because. Uh, the iodine doesn't come out of the synovial space anytime soon, and it does so fractionated over a period of weeks, sometimes up to a month. Uh, and then it, it leaches out in very, very diluted quantities to the lymphatic system very, very slowly. So uh, 
because of that, there's not a great risk of contrast reaction for an arthrogram. Okay, the greater risk is the joint infection, uh, and that's why sterile technique is important. Remember Steve McNair.